Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, in this recording, I'm going to present the 2017 quantitative economics article titled Solving the Diamond Mortensen Pisaridis Model Accurately. It's joint paper with uh, uh, Nicola Pichowski Nedun. So, the basic theme of our paper is that an accurate global projection algorithm is critical for quantifying the basic moments of the famous DMP model uh, for the labor market. And we show that log linearization understates the mean and the volatility of the unemployment rate, but at the same time overstates the volatility of the labor market tightness, as well as the magnitude of the unemployment vacancy correlation. In addition, log linearization also understates the impulse responses in unemployment rates in recessions, but overstates the responses in the labor market tightness in booms. And finally, we also show that in a more, uh, um, in a more realistic model with capital second order perturbation uh, tends to be quite inaccurate. So I'm gonna describe two models. The first one is hector Minoski model. Uh, published in 2008 at AER, and the second is um, um, uh, Pichowski, Nedun, Zhang, and Kuhn model that published in 2018 at AER as well. So we're going to analyze um, a, a simplified version of the of the um, um, of the second model. All right, so let's look at the um, Hagedorn-Minoski model. So the model setup is fairly well known, and I should mention that our um, replication effort on their work is is really um, a complement to their work. So we are we we end up not criticizing them at all, but reinforcing uh, their basic insight. Okay, so um, I'm gonna uh, show the quantitative results later on, and you'll know what I mean. So their basic setup is that uh, a representative household with the perfect consumption insurance, the household pools the income of the, all the members together before choosing per capita consumption and asset holdings. So they are using linear utility. In other words, representative household is risk neutral uh, with the time discount factor of beta. Uh, there's also a representative firm that uses labor as the single productive input and the matching function they are, they are using the Dan Han, Rami and Watson specification. So, and the iota is the curvature. So theta is the labor market tightness defined as the vacancy to unemployment ratio. The job finding rate from the perspective of an unemployed worker is basically the number of new hires divided by the total number of, of, of unemployed workers, and that's a function of the labor market tightness. Uh, the vacancy feeding rate or job feeding rate is from the perspective of the firm. That's basically the probability for a given vacancy being filled. In other words, that's the total number of new matches or new hires, new hires divided by the total number of available vacancies. And that's also a function of labor market tightness. And in particular, the probability, uh, the vacancy feeding rate is a decreasing function of labor market tightness. Basically, if you face more competitors as a company and then the probability for you to hire uh, a worker given a vacancy is gonna go down. So constant return to scale uh, production function for the firm. So with the labor being the single productive input and the lock labor productivity follows a standard AR1 process with the long-term mean of zero. And the, the unit cost of vacancy posting um, is given by this form and the slightly uh, non-standard, but uh, end up not being so important anyway. So employment accumulation is total employment next period equals current period employment, net of uh, separation uh, plus number of new hires, which equals to the total of vacancies available times the vacancy feeling rate. Okay, so that's the number of new hires. So we're going to impose a vacancy non-activity constraint anyway, uh, just to ensure numerical accuracy. So wages are from the standard Nash bargaining process. 
So, and that's linked up to labor, uh, marginal product of labor, but it is not tied together uh, as in the case of a frictionless labor market. Okay, so dividends basically output minus wages minus total vacancy costs. Goods market clear, and in the temporal job creation condition, it's basically, and this lambda is the Lagrange multiplier uh, for the vacancy uh, non activity constraint. The bottom line is that the left hand side is the um, marginal cost of hiring, the right hand side is marginal benef benefit of hiring. So you have one additional worker after paying the marginal cost of hiring and that work is going to produce for you and for you to get for the firm to gain marginal product of labor but the firm has to pay out uh, wages wages so you have to add, subtract uh, um, w which is wage and then net of depreciation you have some one extra unit of uh, employment left and that one extra unit is going to save you the marginal costs of hiring next period in other words this piece uh, uh, within the parentheses is the marginal continuation value for the extra unit of employment. And finally, because of the vacancy non-activity non constraint, then we need to write down the Kuhn-Tucker conditions. All right, so our numerical algorithm, um, uh, which is a contribution in this paper, uh, is, is projection, globally non-linear projection method with um, uh, parameterized expectations. And the parameterized expectations idea, uh, we are following Cristiano and Fisher 2000 GEDC paper. So in the hector manoski setup, uh, there's only one single state variable because uh, mm, labor is done in productive input, constant return to scale, as well as linear utility. So XT log labor pr productivity is the only state variable and we need to solve for labor market tightness as a function of uh, log labor productivity. And, uh, and, uh, and we also need to solve mm, for the Lagrange multiplier function, okay? And they both have to satisfy the Kuhn Tucker condition. And uh, as noted, we're going to parameterize the conditional expectation function because that's a smooth function that's going to um, uh, go 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 more easily in a in a projection code. So um, so we're going to approximate. The condition expectation first. After that, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna back out. We're gonna use a one-to-one -one mapping uh, between the conditional expectation and all the other uh, endogenous variables, and they are by eliminating the need to approximate the Lagrange multiplier function directly as well as theta function because both can be uh, kinked. Okay, and that may generate some difficulty numerically uh, in, in practice. So that can be a, a kind of pain in the neck. So, uh, so after we calculate the conditional expectation, we first calculate this Q tilde function. So which is basically uh, the unit cost of vacancy divided by the um, conditional expectation. If that Q tilde uh, probability is below one, then we know everything is cool. So there's no uh, extra complication to worry about. In other words, that non-activity constraint for vacancy is not binding. And then we know that we want to multiply ought to be zero. And then we just set the Q tilde to be Q and use the inverse function of the vacancy filling rate to back out the labor market tightness. Okay. If on the other hand, Q tilde is greater or equal to one, especially greater than one. And then we know the a vacancy constraint is binding, and then we set the um, v to be zero because it's binding. Vacancy to be a vacancy to be zero, and therefore labor market tightness as v u ratio must be zero as well. And then q is one, and then we calculate the Lagrange multiplier as kappa t minus as the unit cost of vacancy minus the conditional expectation. So that's how we. Uh, satisfy the intertemporal job creation condition. A bit more computational details because this is an article published at the Quantitative Economics uh, Journal. So we approximate 
the persistent lock productivity process XT based on the Rowenhorst method. And in the paper, uh, we've gone through great details to show that Rowenhorst method is much more accurate than the popular Tonkin as well as the Tonkin Hussey method. The reason is that the persistency uh, of the log productivity process in monthly calibration uh, is much uh, higher than 0 0.9, okay? Any, any level above 0 0.9, the Tonkin and Tonkin Hussey methods are gonna uh, induce quite a bit of um, uh, noise, uh, whereas the Rovenhorst method is quite accurate and we provided all kinds of details uh, to justify the statement I just made. And the details are in the paper. I won't spend time uh, in the presentation to discuss that point. So we use 17 grid points on Rovenhorst uh, method. So the 17 grid points cover exactly the values of XT that are uh, above and are forced in unconditional standard deviations above and below the mean. Oh, by the way, all that I should have mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, all the programs are linked below the video and they are on my research page as well. So the conditional expectation can be calculated once the um, discrete state space is set up, conditional expectation can be calculated uh, uh, using one line MATLAB as a matrix uh, multiplication. So we have also implemented the uh, continuous state space uh, in which conditional expectation is implemented through the uh, Gauss uh, Hermite quadrature. And the results are, uh, are quite close, uh, virtually identical uh, for this model. So to obtain the initial guess of the conditional expectation, so we use models log linear solution through that name. Right, as I mentioned that we also implemented the, the model on continuous state space. So, um, so the range is still four unconditional un standard deviations of XT from deviation from its mean. And we use 10th order Chebyshev polynomials and the results are not sensitive to, that, to the order 10. And Chebyshev nodes obtained using the collocation method and this are fairly uh, well-known well -known, well -known technique in numerical analysis. Uh, we rely heavily on my Ohio State colleague, Mario Miranda, who has done phenomenal job and I've uh, been using his compute econ uh, toolbox for the past decade and uh, uh, quite convenient. He's been improving the toolbox over the years as well. So, um, so basically we get to free, we get to be free to think about uh, economic modeling and implementation and leave all the, uh, the more detailed uh, level uh, worries to him. And uh, basically you get to use functional approximation, interpolation, and uh, we get to experiment simply based on his toolbox. Uh, we get to using a Chebyshev global approximation, or uh, we prefer to actually use finite element, local approximation. We use many nodes and on each small region we use we fit the cubic spline, okay? So, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, Mario and, 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 and co-author Compute Econ Toolbox and gives us very convenient uh, tools to do that. Uh, we don't worry about the technical details. I highly recommend uh, you use, uh, you try out Compute Econ Toolbox, extremely, extremely convenient. As noted, uh, with continuous state space, we implement conditional expectation, um, uh, with the Gauss Hermite quadrature. So weekly calibration, we use exactly the, um, the, the, the parameter values from Hagedomanowski. So let me skip the details. So these are the results. And uh, uh, I should mention briefly that um, we, 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 we try to pay attention to details in, in, in writing the paper. So it turns out when, um, when log labor productivity is extremely small, it's like below 3.5 unconditional standard deviations below the mean, it turns out the conditional expectation can be negative. In other words, without capital in the model, in other words, the firm wants to exit the economy, okay? So uh, 
Um, so, so the way we deal with it, although our numerical grid is minus four plus four, but the in simulations, we only do uh, minus 3.46 or so unconditional standard deviations. The, the, the grid is still uh, fairly large and hardly um, the simulated values hardly go outside the bin. All right, so the left panel is conditional expectation. You can see is quite smooth. Okay, so um, um, so this is discrete state space, continuous state space is virtually identical. So uh, the, the right panel is the labor market tightness. I can you can you can clearly see that when it hits zero, and you see uh, it's not exactly a kink, but quite close to a kink. So that's the um, kink the region that we would like to avoid approximating directly. So that's why we ended up using a conditional expectation, parameterized expectation, as first pointed out by uh, by by. Um, by many people, and we're basically following Chris Strand and Fisher. All right, so uh, this is our table one that reports labor market moments. So as noted earlier, our replication only ends up reinforcing Hagedorn Monoski thesis. All right, so this is why. So this is their table four in which they report the standard uh, a set of a standard set of labor market moments. So the, the, key, the key moment is the unemployment volatility. So they report 14.5% per quarter. So um, uh, the Scheimer puzzle, uh, 2000 Scheimer, 2005 AER uh, puzzle is about the volatility of labor market tightness is 29.2%. 20, so uh, actually, Hakuna Manaski implemented using nonlinear method, um, but they were using uh, Tonkin approximation uh, for the discrete state space, and we show uh, not quite accurate. It turns out that their results are quite close to uh, lock, uh, more uh, closer to the lock linearization results. In particular, the, um, the unemployment volatility is 13.3 percent, fairly close to what they were reporting, and so is the volatility of labor market tightness. But look at them, our uh, projection output, and so we can you can see that the number jumps out at you. Uh, it's the unemployment volatility. We get 25.7%. 20, That's almost twice as large as what they were reporting. So my understanding is that Hakuna Manoski had to jump through all kinds of hoops uh, for their calibration of flow value of unemployment activities of 0.955. So, and even after the publication, many, 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 many re researchers have criticized their high flow value of unemployment uh, activities. And what we are saying is that, look, uh, you actually uh, don't really need that high flow value. And that's why in some of our uh, other papers, so uh, we, we, we ended up using a much lower, well, somewhat lower uh, value, flow value of unemployment uh, we using in the range of 0.85, for example. So on the other hand, the labor market tightness volatility is a bit lower uh, than what they were reporting, but still, and that labor market volatility, uh, market tightness volatility is not that uh, different from what you will see in the post-war data. So, Nonlinear dynamics projection versus lock linearization. Okay, so uh, this is a sample illustration of the of the of the simulated paths. The the exogenous process is of the lock labor productivity is exactly identical between lock linearization and the projection. The blue sample path is the projection. You can see that out unemployment spikes up periodically. Uh, but that upward spikes are completely missed by lock linearization. Okay. On the other hand, you get to see lock linearization have generated a lot of spikes in labor market uh, tightness, but you don't see that in from the from 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 the projection code. And the reason is really the the the, the nonlinearity in the search and matching. Uh, process because in bad times, uh, because in bad times, the the the, uh, the matching function implies that the marginal 
uh, cost of hiring runs into a downward floor, as we described in, uh, uh, in our 2018 AER paper, runs into a downward floor. Uh, but uh, but, um, but uh, so that will drive up the unemployment rates. At the same time, profits are dropping and the, your marginal costs of hiring remain high. Okay, and that's give you, and that will, that's gonna give you disaster dynamics and the projection code is gonna capture that, but uh, you ignore all that using log linearization. So on the other hand, in good times, uh, because the vacancy feeding rate is gonna drop because you are facing a lot of uh, competing companies in terms of hiring new workers. So the Q rate is gonna drop and as a result, the marginal cost of hiring is gonna rise up on you pretty fast. In other words, unemployment rate is gonna is not gonna chop as fast in the projection code as as it would in the lock linearization code okay in other words the true dynamics of economic booms are much more gradual than what you would see in a lock linearization uh, solution okay so ergodic distribution so this is this is this is the distribution on the left panel is our one million months uh, one million weeks, excuse me, uh, from the model stationary distribution. So you can clearly see, so unemployment rates go way up when times are bad. Well, as if you use log linearization, you miss all that. So this is vacancy, okay. Um, um, uh, vacancy it's, um, can get quite nonlinear as well. Uh, well, as log linearization, you, 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 you downplay, you would downplay that. So labor market tightness. So um, the projection code literally respect the theoretical property that labor market tightness is a one-to-one -one, uh, mapping, one-to-one -one function to lock productivity, right? Well, as lock linearization, we'll miss that in particular because lock linearization um, underestimates the unemployment rate in good times. As a result, the labor market tightness gets blown up uh, in good times. That's why you see the big uh, uh, brush uh, towards good times. So nonlinear impulse response as well. So um, what we have here is basically, uh, this, is, uh, this is unemployment rates. So this is bad time, this is good time. Because of models nonlinearity, the impulse responses are gonna depend on initial condition. So the left panel is, a, it's, it's the impulse response with the initial condition being a bad economy, which is fifth percentile of the model's stationary distribution of N and X. So, and that, that's a one standard deviation negative shock on labor, on log labor productivity. And you can see the projection code that drops way more than the log linearization code. So the solid line is projection, the broken line, the dotted line is log linearization. So, and this is a impulse response in good times in the 95th uh, percentile of the model stationary distribution. You see that the, in this case, the impulse response out of log linearization is much more responsive. It's much bigger, somewhat bigger, I should say, than that from um, projection code because marginal cost of hiring uh, um, are, are, are increasing uh, pretty fast in good times because of the nonlinearity externality in terms of you competing with your competitors hiring workers the projection code will capture that but the log linearization will miss that so this is what this slide is saying uh, labor market tightness so um, as alluded earlier, so in good times, you see the log linear that the log linearization is going to exaggerate their impulse response in theta than uh, relative to the, the accurate solution from from projection. So Euler equation errors. So let's see. We are using. Um, all right, let me briefly explain explain how Euler equation errors are calculated. So basically, uh, the, there's only one state variable uh, in, um, in, 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 in the model, which is a lock productivity, uh, but we include the employment here because, it, uh, because some of the uh, some of the endogenous variables, such as vacancies, for example, will depend on employment. And uh, on the 
Um, so we, we, we divvy up the grid into 1,000 by 1,000 and uh, solve the model and impose the model solution on the large grid and then do simul and then, and then and then we can calculate uh, no simul excuse me, I misspoke, no simulation is involved here. And we basically uh, calculate the oil equation error on the finer grid than what we used in the, in the, in the, in the projection code. Um, so the left, left panel is oil equation errors on the states in the state space out of projection is, you know, uh, it's relatively small e to the minus 10 to the minus four, whereas from log linearization, you see um, orders, uh, several orders of magnitude bigger. So figure five reports dynamic oil equation errors because the grid is relatively large. All right, especially on the n dimension. So sometimes the economy doesn't visit all the spaces, all right, or uh, all, all, the, all the areas within the state space. So we do simulations that the economy run on its own, the ergodic distribution. So this, and then we calculate the oil equation errors on each of the uh, period on the sample path. Uh, one million weeks, what weekly periods, uh, you see that most of the time, oil equation errors out of projection method are really small, okay? Well, as for log linearizations, so again, orders of magnitude bigger. All right, so let me get to um, one version of uh, our 2018 AER a model, which is with capital, but we calibrate the model differently. Uh, to 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 mimic the, um, pop, the standard practice in the macro labor literature. So environment, we're gonna we're gonna use log utility. So this means that uh, both capital and labor are gonna become state variables in addition to log labor log uh, total factor productivity. So we're gonna have three state variables now. Um, life is getting more excited. So Cobb Douglas production function and the log uh, total factor productivity and X bar is the long-term average, rho is the persistence. So uh, we, 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 we always do this. Um, we tidy up our implementation carefully in the sense that in this case, we're gonna rescale X bar such that the marginal product of labor in the simulation is around the one, okay? So doing so helps us uh, provide the cleaner economic interpretation for uh, labor market parameters such like such as the flow value value of unemployment okay so like 0.95 literally means 0.95 um, so matching function is the same as before we continue to impose vacancy non-activity constraint, but it turns out in the simulation of this model in this calibration, uh, that constraint is not binding at all, but we're we are, we are, we are, we are tracking it around anyway, just in case. Uh, capital accumulation, uh, that this fee is the installation function. We're following Urban Yearman's um, 98 uh, GME article, as surprising in production economies. So this, this formulation is extremely convenient and I love it uh, for aggregate the modeling, for aggregate asset pricing models, for example, uh, because, so, so because when investment goes to zero from the positive range, the marginal benefit of investment is go to infinity. So as a result, you don't have to impose any uh, irreversible in investment constraint on this model because uh, it's automatically positive out of the model. Uh, again, why we need that? Because in the data, aggregate investment is never negative. So it's fairly convenient to ensure that. Whereas for the V constraint, it's not automatic. Uh, we have to uh, impose a constraint on top of that. So the equilibrium wage uh, is Nash wage again. And uh, this piece, one minus alpha times um, uh, output divided by employment, that's the marginal product of labor. Okay, fairly standard. So in equilibrium, goods market clears. So we have two, two functional equations to solve. The first function uh, is the intertemporal job creation condition. The left-hand side is basically, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention. So the, the, the unit cost of vacancy is constant. 
kappa is constant, uh, not time bearing as in the Hagedom uh, Monoski case. So it's constant, that's your marginal uh, cost of hiring and with the vacancy constraint accounted for with the Lagrange multiplier. The left hand side is marginal cost of hiring, the right hand side is the marginal benefit of hiring. You produce marginal product of labor, you pay the worker with wages, and then net of separation, you have one extra unit of employment that's going to worth marginal cost of hiring next period for you. That's the expected, that's the continuation value. So, and in, on top of that, because we have capital, we need to study the intertemporal investment Euler equation. So, and that's the marginal cost of investment equals marginal benefit of investment. Okay, and finally, of course, uh, we, can, we have to respect the Kuhn Tucker conditions. So we again adapt um, the globally nonlinear projection algorithm with parameterized expectations. So we're gonna solve for the investment function and we're gonna solve for the investment function. Again, it's automatic, automatically positive in the model anyway. And we're gonna approximate the investment function and the conditional expectation on the right-hand side of the intertemporal job creation condition. So we're gonna discretize. So uh, in this model, because, uh, because there, are, there, are, there are three state variables, we're not gonna do the continuous state space again. So we're just gonna do the discrete state space. So conditional expectation is calculated within the code using matrix operation uh, multiplication is uh, to, 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 to simplify our life a little bit. So finite element methods, cubic spline, uh, one, 100 nodes of N, of employment and capital. This is fairly, fairly, fairly accurate. Uh, in the, in the, towards the end of our article, we reported the extend, extensive set of um, um, comparative statics uh, to evaluate the robustness of the quantitative moments vis-a-vis -vis the grid setup. Uh, oftentimes, um, grids, grid set, the parameters in the grid setup impact on your quantitative results as well. So, so we really want to be careful uh, just to make sure we know what we are doing. So uh, in, my, in my experience, one, 100 versus 100 is an overkill, okay? So it's like 25 to 25 is probably accurate enough. So, um, so if you want to publish a paper in a top journal, probably 50-50 is sufficient. So, but, uh, but we want to we wanna ensure uh, the, accur the accuracy of our computing. So uh, after all, this is an article published in Quantitative Economics. So we went a little bit overdrive. 100 to 100, it turns out the, 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 the code takes about one week to run. Uh, so we are, we're not worried about the speed, we worry more about accuracy. So finite element, and uh, this um, is a little bit of thought has gone into the choice as well. So you could use uh, Chebyshev global approximation. The basic idea is that, uh, um, the basic idea is that you, you on, the, on the complete state space, you impose Chebyshev polynomials. Um, and that's one way to do it, but we are worried about the strong nonlinearity within the model is like within some disaster areas, right? If in some state of the world, there are disasters and um, there's strong nonlinearity, we don't wanna, the, um, the any approximation issues within this extreme area to contaminate the quality of, um, of our approximation in more normal times. So that's why we ended up um, uh, using finite element method, 100 by 100, we we divide the big state space in small areas, and within a, each small areas, a three-dimensional uh, space, we impose a cubic spline locally. Okay, that's the finite element method. So, and that's the, that that idea. We feel um, we feel comfortable. We feel better with the accuracy of this idea. So you can go more. Um, uh, you can you can be more fancy about it. Uh, that's a procedure uh, called the Smoyak procedure, and that can ensure the accuracy. At the same time, you 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 work with a sparse grid. Uh, at this point, we haven't failed. We were stuck for a while, but then we figured out how to solve the model anyway uh, using the tensor product. Uh, we basically. Um, we, we, we ended up using tensor product. Tensor product is like literally 100 by 100. 
Okay, and on top of uh, on top of seventeen grid points, again, it's a fairly large grid, and we have two functional equations. At the end of the day, we have to solve three hundred and forty thousand nonlinear equations for three hundred and forty thousand coefficients. So it's kind of fun <laughs> to work everything through, but uh, but um, but um, um, you you need to have a sense of humor uh, to do computational economics. Um, that uh, that you equate difficulty with pleasures. <laughs> All right, so we so so tensor product, as I was saying. So um, uh, if someone wants to embed the model in a in a new Keynesian DSGE framework, a lot more state variables, and then you have to think really hard about uh, how to make the computational task more feasible. Maybe using sparse. Uh, matrix uh, Smoyak procedure uh, instead of maybe in that case tensor product will not be feasible, uh, but that's a challenge challenge for another day. Uh, so far, I'm, I'm I'm reporting what we have already figured out. So again, uh, mentioned earlier about the Miranda and co-authors Compute Econ Toolbox. Uh, I cannot uh, stop praising about them. Um, uh, Mario's phenomenal work and that makes everything feasible for us. So we were we were stuck at the last stage for a long time. Um, 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 so it turns out the standard, the Newton style methods for solving nonlinear equations, like in MATLAB, so that's F solve, uh, is quite efficient for small grid. So in our experience in this model, when the N and the K grid is below 20 nodes each, and then um, uh, Newton style methods will fly. Okay, we'll solve very quickly, uh, no problem. Uh, but uh, but uh, any larger grid that you want to worry about the more about accuracy because if you didn't know the accurate result x and you wouldn't know your accuracy right so and then we were worried to think about accuracy and then uh, we expand to a larger grid with more uh, grid points and then uh, the, the program just refuses to converge okay and we were stuck for uh, um, a year and a half or probably longer i couldn't remember the details and then and then, and then we read the latest uh, computational economics uh, articles in the latest journals and then we find out the um, uh, article by uh, uh, ken jordan co-authors they were reporting uh, at the jedc so this is a few years ago, 2017 or 18, at the detailed references cited in the article. So they were reporting that, look, guys, we don't know why. This is not the contraction mapping. We don't know why. But for whatever reason, if we implement derivative-free fixed point iteration, the system will solve. <laughs> so when I first read that, I was like, really? I was really suspicious because uh, because uh, because uh, because we were stuck for a long time, and then I was like, hey, what's there's nothing to lose, right? So and we so I just sit down and code up the fixed point iteration because every all the basic routines have been coded up already. It took me less than ten minutes. Uh, to, to, to write down to code up the fixed point iteration. And, uh, and uh, it was like, I was just, then watch the program converges. It was this marvelous experience. So uh, the errors just keep dropping. So occasionally it's gonna get bounced around uh, because it's not contraction mapping, there's no guarantee. It's monoto monotonically decreasing for the errors, but eventually give it time, it will converge. It always converges. So I only experience like twice or three times the error just blows up to infinity, but that happens uh, kind of rarely. Uh, if that's the case, you need to decrease your small, uh, decrease your dampening parameter. So it's a lot of uh, uh, practical experience. Uh, without knowing it, your program won't, your model won't solve. It's just, uh, it's just a little bit of uh, a luck and uh, um, serendipity uh, as well. So I thought that was fun experience to share. All right, so calibration. Um, let's see, we calibrate to mimic the standard, uh, to mimic the standard uh, practice in the macro labor literature, we calibrate the monthly log linear solution to the post-war US data, okay? So I won't go through the details because the point of the paper is really computational and uh, um, 
Right, I just wanna highlight the, right, I just wanna highlight the flow value of unemployment activities, B equals 0.95, uh, basically, this is where we're, we're in the we're, we're, we're following we're following Hagedorn and Oski, so there's no question about it. So we 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 um we we so we are inspired by their insight and their modern is so simple, so and it's easy to uh, build on their work and uh, and um, and uh, given the computational challenge of our 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 line of work, and we really want to keep the model as simple as possible and. Um, and the worker sparkling weight is relatively low. Uh, vacancy fix, um, cost of vacancy posting, which is constant. And then all these prime values in the log linear solution is going to imply average unemployment rate and uh, unemployment volatility. Then what we're going to do is that look, this is a log linear solution, okay? Parameter values calibrated using a linear solution. And then we're going to um, put the projection code on top of it and uh, see how different. Uh, the projection results from the log linear results in terms of key uh, macro as well as labor market moments. So uh, before I show before I show the results, let me let me let me let me report the accuracy result. This is again from uh, uh, inspired by uh, uh, Ken Jutt's earlier work. So we calculate unit free job creation. Uh, equation errors. This is oil equation errors. Unit three means that we're talking in terms of uh, uh, consumption, uh, same unit as consumption. Unit three investment oil equation errors, and this uh, the, this is basically the definition. So you can see that job creation condition error. So the left panel is uh, projection. The right panel is localization. Again, you see that the, the projection errors are just orders, you know, um, orders of magnitudes, uh, two, two, three orders of magnitude smaller than log linearization. So investment oil equation, let me see, let me move my uh, uh, picture. So the projection is 10 to the minus three. And then you may be surprised to say, wait a second, how come the log linearization is actually even smaller? And this turns out to be an illusion uh, because right here, because a Gothic distribution for projection is pretty large and pretty wide. It turns out in the projections of the economy, the economy can wander far, far away from the deterministic steady state is about here, okay? Well, as a log linear economy, you just looking at the small area surrounding deterministic steady state because the economy never wanders far away from the steady state. And therefore it turns out artificially the oil equation errors for investment oil equation are kind of low. It probably looks like even smaller than that from the projection code, but it's an illusion because for the projection code, we're talking about errors uh, down here could be, right? Well, as a log linear economy and uh, never visits that area at all. Uh, a Gothic distribution again on this slide, I have unemployment from projection in the left panel, right panel, I have log linearization. So again, the body of the distribution is, is everywhere. Okay, labor market is much more dynamic. We really need to solve the model carefully using using uh, using uh, uh, globally nonlinear method, and uh, we ended up using projection because uh, because we work with the first order conditions directly. Uh, because for the diamond modern modern simplicity readers model, oftentimes the uh, wholesale condition wouldn't hold, and then competitive equilibrium is not pretty optimal. So there's no value function uh, iteration for you to use. Okay. So vacancy quite a bit different as well. Uh, probably not as dramatic as unemployment, and this labor market tightness again. So the nonlinearity in good times. In the Q equation margin of cost of hiring, uh, that effect is accurately captured by 
uh, projection method, well, as log linearization, uh, labor market tightness just blows up uh, because uh, because unemployment drops too low uh, with um, uh, log linear method. In terms of uh, uh, quantitative moments, so again, because we are calibrating using log linear solution to the data, uh, output volatility is matched 1.78 versus 1.72 percent. Uh, but if you look at the if you look at the projection code, it's actually the true volatility is um, is 3.3 percent. Uh, probably more conspicuously, more drastically, the log linear unemployment rate is matched with the unemployment mean unemployment rate in the data from 5.87 in the data 5.8. 75 in the model, but the projection code we are we are looking at um, we are looking at uh, uh, 10.75. Okay, almost twice as high as log linearization. Why is that? Well, this is why uh, you get the drastic uh, movements, uh, nonlinear dynamics in unemployment rates uh, accurately captured by projection code, uh, but not by the uh, log linearization. So that's first moment of our employment rate, and let's look at the second moments. So again, that's that. That's the data. Uh, all the empirical uh, measurement details are reported in the paper, and uh, because the presentation, my presentation is mostly about the numerics, uh, computational methods. So I'm not going to spend much time on uh, empirical work, which is all, all fairly standard. So log linearization. Again, we are matching that to the data using log linear economy. So look at the. Um, Look at the projection. So unemployment, what volatility turns out to be only slightly higher, uh, not as drastic as in Hector Manoski. Uh, I guess that's good because uh, capital provides some kind of buffer. Uh, on the other hand, the labor market tightness volatility is quite a bit lower uh, in projection code than in the log linear solution. Uh, another aspect is that in the projection code, the um, UV, the unemployment vacancy correlation, the magnitude uh, is somewhat lower than that in the log linear solution. Well, as in this case, look at the second order perturbation, that correlation becomes positive. Okay, so on top of that, unemployment volatility is exaggerated on the second order perturbation. So, um, uh, so our intuition is that. Why, why is that the case? So our intuition is that um, because the true economy can wander far away from the deterministic steady state, and if you just impose a second order, a lower order uh, perturbation, and your second order terms are going to be calculated using information surrounding the deterministic steady state. So when the economy wanders further, further away, from that anchor, and then the second order terms are going to suffer in terms of accuracy. Okay? So in this economy, at least, I find the, the second order um, uh, solution to be uh, even less accurate, less trustworthy, I would say, than the log linear solution. So uh, all right, so let me conclude. So in this article, we show that we try to argue that an accurate global projection algorithm uh, is crucial for quantifying the basic moments of diamond mortens and piece of readers model. So uh, I should issue a caveat in the sense that we haven't, uh, um, we haven't looked at uh, higher order perturbations that can be implemented in Dynair and Dynair++, for example. Uh, uh, so that's an open issue that deserves to be uh, looked at further. So, but uh, but the, my worry is that uh, those higher order terms again are calculated using information surrounding the deterministic steady state. When the economy wanders further away from that, and the higher order terms may 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 suffer accordingly as well, and may give you strange results that uh, may have nothing to do with the model. Mm. Okay, so that's everything I, I have to say for this paper. Thank you.